That's the feeling we've all had. Now new shoes would make you glad, but the best time you recall when you wore no shoes at all. Back the day. Hey there and welcome to another edition of Living Lightly. I'm Dan Derica, and today I've got some kind of older footage of an interview that I did with Jack Walter over at Red Earth Farms, a neighboring homesteading community, and he's going to be talking about the uh, sustainable livestock grazing system that he's implemented there to restore the land. Now Red Earth Farms has very similar land to what we have here at Dancing Rabbit. It's highly erodible and highly eroded land that's been run into the ground by conventional agriculture over the years. And uh, he's been there for a few years with livestock rotational grazing. Uh, and he's made a lot of improvements, significant improvements to the land. Um, he's since moved on to another project in another state but um, it's what he talks about in this video is still relevant. Now it goes on for quite a while and I've broken it up into some parts, um, but it's some interesting stuff. And if you finish the first part, I'll probably be posting everything at the same time. So if you finish the first part, you can just go on to the next one. Now, some of you may be thinking, why livestock? Livestock is responsible for a lot of the environmental problems that we have. It's a huge contributor to climate change. It's a huge consumer of water. Um, but livestock have been around for thousands of years and humanity has benefited from having that relationship with them. And livestock can be raised sustainably. Um, the industrial agriculture and livestock production that we have in this country is totally unsustainable and it's being replicated all across the world. But there are different ways to, uh, to raise livestock and this is what we're talking about today. Jack will go into detail in their system and we'll do a little tour of their livestock and their systems there. I'm gonna have to warn you that my hair is a little bit longer in this footage, but I have to say I look kind of like a rock star, like a heavy metal rock star interviewing somebody about livestock. <laughs> Today we're at Yarrow Hill Farm at Red Earth Farms Community and we're talking with Jack Walter about how he's utilizing livestock to restore farmland and to provide an income for his family. Thanks Dan. Yeah, as, as Dan's already said, this is Yarrow Hill Farm. By the way, welcome to our farm. Um, it's early spring right now and we are, we are hoping to dodge some more raindrops so that we can get a little bit more pasture growth. Uh, what we do here is we utilize animals to rotationally graze our pasture to improve the fertility of the pasture, the animal health, and ultimately to increase the fertility of the entire farm so that we can grow better crops in both our field crop area and our vegetable space. What would you say is your general philosophy in animal agriculture? Our philosophy for animal agriculture would be to utilize the inborn traits of each of the animals that we choose to raise to allow them to express their full genetic potential on grass. So that is included to some extent trying to reverse industrial agriculture's focus on high productivity with high grain inputs and moving all of our ruminant species, the cattle, the sheep, and the goats away from a grain-based diet back to a forage only diet. That has reduced our yields to some extent, but we also believe that it's incredibly uh, beneficial to the animals and their health and longevity. So what kind of livestock are you keeping here? Uh, here at Yarrow Hill Farms, we keep uh, cattle, uh, predominantly uh, dairy breeds, and we, we do milk occasionally, but we predominantly use those for production of beef. Uh, the dairy breeds have not been bred to the point, the, the breeds we chose, have not been bred to the point where uh, they cannot produce on grass, just that they're not as productive on grass. We also raise both wool sheep and hair sheep. We raise dairy goats. Uh, we do raise pigs seasonally, and we're moving in the direction of raising them year-round. We also raise uh, turkeys, ducks, chickens. Uh, we previously uh, utilized rabbits to take care of some excess produce and to produce fiber, uh, but we've since moved away from that. Okay, well, Jack, why don't you show us what you got going on here? Certainly. Let's walk over this way. <clears throat> Yay! 
One of the things we're going to talk about is how we utilize animals to increase the fertility of our pasture and produce an economic viable product. So to do that here, we utilize rotational grazing with multi-species and we, we do that year round trying to minimize the amount of off-farm inputs that we do. To do that, we utilize several, uh, several different technologies, uh, portable electric netting, permanent electric netting, uh, sorry, permanent electric fencing, and then permanent non-electric fencing. Uh, we graze multiple species of animals. You can possibly hear the cow in the background asking why she's not getting moved yet. Uh, we also graze sheep and goats, and then periodically move our pigs through our pastures, and then we utilize our poultry, our turkeys, ducks, and chickens to scratch through manure patties and help to disperse that manure and eat any of the, the parasites uh, that can affect some of our animals. We do practice rotational grazing. Uh, that's a technique that in Missouri was pioneered by Jim Garrish, one of the early uh, rotational grazing individuals involved with the Extension Service. Uh, we believe that it's the best way that we can allow each of the animal species on our farm to display and exhibit its innate behavior patterns and mimic the way the natural grass system in this part of the country co-evolved with ruminant livestock or ruminant grazing animals. Of all the things that you could have done here on your farm, why did you choose livestock? What's, what's special about the land here that's, you know, appropriate for livestock? Well, Part of our choice of this land was because it was suitable for livestock. Uh, my family and I, uh, one, we love the animals, uh, we love interacting with them, and we love what they can do for the soil. When we made the choice of here, it, it became an even more pressing need to utilize the animals. The land that we moved to uh, three years ago, almost four years ago, uh, had been over farmed. It was, it was relatively thin soil, very poor species diversity as far as what the pasture and what the grasses that were growing up were. And animals properly managed can reverse poor management practices. It really all comes down to the management practices that are utilized. Yeah, we have a lot of problems over at, uh, over at Dancing Rabbit because we have thin soil that was conventionally farmed for many years. And now we're dealing with trying to grow uh, just regular vegetable crops there to you know provide food for ourselves and we're having problems because it seems like animals would maybe be better for restoring the land there than uh, just bringing in inputs from everywhere and doing cover crops and, and using fossil fuel uh, to run a tractor over and over again to, to, to and it, it's sort of a slower process um, when you don't have the animals involved, is what I, I think. You know. I, I would agree. Um, I guess I'll touch on what you asked about the philosophy thing, our okay. philosophy at raising animals, because what you said kind of highlights it. I firmly believe that the fastest way to heal degraded land is with animal agriculture, but I also believe that the fastest way to destroy a perfectly functioning ecosystem is with animal agriculture. The difference between those two extremes is the management and the goals of the farmer that's running the livestock on the land. So or, uh, Dancing Rabbit's specific uh, problems with low soil fertility, thin soil, and nutrient sources could be solved with animal agriculture. Uh, but just as likely could continue to worsen the problems if the livestock were not managed in a way that took the holistic health of the land, the animals, and the people managing them into, into consideration. But that brings up to me the, the issue that, that a lot of people have with livestock and animal agriculture is its impact on climate change. And um, what, do you, what would you say in response to that? I, I think that we're at a very interesting turning point with agriculture in that I feel that the industrial agricultural model has probably been a significant contributor to climate change and that it was not the animals, but it was the profit-driven approach to livestock management that has resulted in some of the, probably some of the worst ecological problems that we could possibly encounter in agriculture of any kind, be it animal or, or plant-based agriculture. And I think that comes down to the fact that we've taken ruminant species that evolved to subsist and grow and reproduce on just biomass that grows with natural rainfall, 
and we've concentrated them into smaller and smaller areas and now farm significant portions of the United States to produce corn and soy that's not used to feed humans. It's used to feed ruminant livestock, which were not, that did not evolve to eat those as a food source. Um, so that, that, that ties back to the poor management of animals and an unethical use of them and in poor living conditions and with major ecological impact and poor farming practices leading to the loss of thousands of years of built up topsoil from the Midwest down the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico. It's clear that humans have been, had a relationship with livestock for thousands of years and they've been able to farm them fairly sustainably during that time. So it's, you, you come to like, uh, why are we not, why is it so unsustainable now? And um, it's not necessarily that the livestock themselves are the issue, it's that um, the way that they're being farmed is, is the problem. So it's, it's possible to sustainably raise livestock. I, I think it is possible to sustainably raise livestock. I also think that we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, to sustainably raise livestock, we would have to reverse the last 60 to 100 years of genetic selection, which is selected for livestock species that perform well in confinement on materials that they were never intended to eat or never never evolved to eat. Um, so that's that's there's a long road ahead to get to a point where we're in sustainable agriculture. There's a lot of it. There's also a lot of education that needs to happen with a populace that that cannot disassociate the poor farming practices that are exist in animal livestock or animal agriculture from the the better practices that are available in sustainable livestock management. So let's actually take a walk around and look at some of the things that the animals have done for us and for our land. Okay, sounds good.